Good morning. <clears throat> I am delighted for this opportunity to be with you this morning, and I want to give special thanks to my pastor, your pastor, my friend, your friend, Louis Galloway. And I'm sure Louis and Bunny will be in your prayers as they are in mine with much gratitude for their ministry over the years here as they begin a new chapter in their life. I'm also grateful to have my buddy Ray Bowden here. We go back to the 1970s, and uh, for 20 years we were colleagues here in ministry, so uh, I'm so delighted that uh, you are in this service today. Our New Testament lesson comes to us from the letter to the Philippians, chapter 1, beginning with verse 3. Paul is in prison. He's writing a letter to one of his favorite congregations in Philippi. What do you do when you're in prison? You think back. You remember. And in Paul's remembering, he also discovers hope for tomorrow. So will you listen for God to speak? I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you because you hold me in your heart. For all of you share in God's grace with me, both in my imprisonment and in my defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness. How I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you to determine what is best, so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory of and praise of God. This is the word of the Lord. Be to Will you join me in a prayer? O oh Lord, focus our minds that we may be open to the whispers of your Spirit. To that end, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, for you alone are our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> this morning I'd like to talk with you about us. As a church, we are at one of those unique moments in our history when one pastor is leaving, our new pastor is arriving. And it is an opportune time for us to ask questions like, who are we? Why are we the way we are? And how did we become as we are? So let me begin by asking you a question. When you think of Second Presbyterian Church, what stories, what memories, what experiences come to your mind? And while you're thinking about that, allow me to share with you several of my own memories. It was a pristine October day in 1981 when I came over that rise in Meridian Street and saw this church for the very first time, its spire seeming to punch a hole in God's heaven. Wow, I said to myself, I did not know that Presbyterians built churches modeled after French cathedrals. And then came a more testy question. What, pray tell, does it mean to be a cathedral church? Over several months, as I talked about that with other pastors in the city and people in this congregation, I came to see that a cathedral church is more than a neighborhood congregation. It is a congregation that wraps its arms around the city where it is located. It is a congregation that dares to wrap its arms around God's world. But I must also say that when I think of Second Presbyterian Church now, it is a different image that frames itself in my mind. It is the image of a family. 
for we are a family of faith. And every Sunday when I enter the sanctuary and nestle into my seat at the, at the rear, my eyes move upward and I see these banners wafting overhead. And I'm reminded of two women who are responsible for those banners. And I'm reminded of women who have gathered for decades, Monday after Monday, to sew and to quilt. I open the bulletin, I see what is going on in the life of this congregation, and I begin to think about baptisms and weddings and funerals and confirmations, and stories begin to wake up my mind. Stories about you and the ways in which you have wrapped your arms of care around one another in times of sorrow as well as in times of joy. And then I'm jolted to attention because worship is about to begin, the choir is singing, and suddenly I remember music has always played a special role in the life of this congregation. Way back, about 1842, a man by the name of John Ketchum, who was then the clerk of the session of this congregation, described Second Presbyterian Church as a church with a good organ <laughs> and the best choir in the West. And then a curmudgeon begins to crawl across my mind, and I say to myself, huh, I wonder what John Ketchum would have said if he had ever dared to travel east. Might he have said the best choir in the country? And I'm curious, as you begin to think about this congregation, what are the stories, the memories hopscotching across your mind? And as you reflect on those stories, do you begin to see the face of Christ appearing in countless disguises in the past of your life? And suddenly we're face to face with our text from 1 Chronicles chapter 16. Remember the marvels the Lord has done. Remembering is a way of rediscovering God's footprints in the sands of our lives. It was a special day in ancient Israel. The ark which had been gathering dust in a backwater village has now settled in Jerusalem and David has declared it to be a national holiday, a day of remembrance. And he breaks into song as he sings, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he delivered us from slavery and bondage in Egypt. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, because somehow he saw us across the great sea. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, because he walked beside us during those 40 years when we were wandering that wilderness. Times of transition are times to remember. It's the Jewish rabbi, philosopher, Abraham Joshua Sheschel, who once said that much of what the Bible demands can be summed up in one imperative. Remember. Remember. So times of transition are times to remember. But not simply to remember all of our individual stories, but as a congregation, as a community of faith, to put our stories together. And when we put our stories together, what does that tell us as to who we are as a congregation? And that was the question. Our coming pastor, Chris Henry, asked me in early December when we were having lunch together. Co-chairs of the pastoral nominating committee had asked if I would have lunch with Chris. I did not know Chris, so I said, well, tell me a little bit about him. Oh, well, they said he's young. And we really love him. Well, I said, young is good. Oh, but they said, he's really young. You know, he's only 36. And do you know how I began to feel? <laughs> really old. You probably did not know this, but of all the 17 individuals who have served as senior pastors in this congregation, I was the third oldest when called. I was 45. And when you look at all those 17 senior ministers, almost half of them were in their 20s or early 30s when they were called. 
So I simply say to you, it's time we go young again. (laughs) And what you need to know is I really like Chris Henry. But as we were sitting at lunch, Chris asked me this question. He said, talk to me about the DNA of Second Presbyterian Church. Well, every congregation has a DNA. It's its history, it's its core values, it's its stories, it's sacred memories, it's shared experiences. And the DNA of no two congregations is alike. And so to answer his question, I put a leash on our text. Remember the marvels the Lord has done and walk that text all the way back to the 1830s. In the 1830s, the Presbyterian Church was in the throes of a bit of a family feud. The question was, how do we live as Presbyterians in this new world of America and in the frontier? Do we change our way of being church? And of course, there was the old school who said, absolutely not. How they did it in Scotland is good enough for us. And then there was the new school who said, but uh, America is not Scotland. And as our country began to grow, the old ways did not fit the new realities. Second Presbyterian Church was a new school congregation. As I think about the new school congregation, there are three words that come to my mind to describe what it is. The words are, weave their way through our story with absolutely amazing creativity. The words are evangelical, ecumenical, and engaging, socially engaging. Now let me talk just a little bit about those three words, particularly that first word, evangelical. Yes, I can see the hair standing up on some of your hair, your skin, because it's a word that has been so abused and politicized that it has virtually lost all of its biblical integrity. But it's a beautiful word. It's a word of the New Testament, the word euangelion, which means simply good news. It was the word used to describe someone who proclaims good news. It was the word Jesus used in his hometown of Nazareth when the people who had watched him grow up said, Now, Jesus, tell us exactly who are you? What is is it you're about? What is your mission? And Jesus said to proclaim good news to the poor, freedom to the captives, sight to the blind. Then that word left some of the early members and pastors of this congregation with a kind of exuberance, well, I'll describe it as a kind of Billy Graham itch in their souls. So Henry Ward Beecher crisscrossed Indiana conducting revivals in which he invited people to follow Christ. But he did it in an interesting way. He talked about the moral challenges of life on the frontier in the context of the Christian faith. Fast forward the calendar 100 years. It's no longer 1830. It's now in the 1930s. And the questions are more intellectual. Some of you Probably not many of us were living through that, but we'll recall from history in the 1920s there had been the Scopes trial that had dominated the headlines of virtually every small town newspaper in in, in America, raising a most unfortunate question. Can you be a Christian and still believe in science and evolution? That is when the pastor of this congregation, Gene Miller, jumped into the fray and said, absolutely you can. And he delivered a series of sermons, of lectures, which later became a book, to which he said to point out that there is no conflict between science and the Bible. And then to the session he said to impress on intelligent minds the great claims of Christ. But the world is constantly changing. Sociologists say that we have, been, we have experienced a kind of seismic cultural shift. And in the 80s and 90s, secularism became the order of the day. And what does it mean for us to live as Christians in a world that is increasingly secular? And that was the time when the great banquet came into being with its focus on personal spiritual renewal. And that is the time when we began for a number of years what we called 
the Festival of Faith, to which we invited some of the finest minds in America to come and spend a weekend with us to share with us what does it mean to live responsibly and with integrity amidst the jangle of voices on the public square as Christians. What does it mean? How do we do that? But the world is constantly changing. And so I say hats off to the lake fellows. Three cheers to you for what you are doing. You've created a program in pubs where you converse with your peers about God, faith, and life. A preacher reminded us last Sunday that roughly one-third of that generation has no religious claims, yet ironically, they believe in God, many of them. They pray. They have spiritual yearnings. So you take good news to where they are. And to begin to see that thread that has woven its way through our congregation, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world is at the heart of who we are. However, that good news must always be reframed and restated in ways that are going to connect and speak to the issues of the world in which we live. Walter Brueggemann calls it the genius of the evangelical imagination. It's an imagination rooted in the good news of a God who acts, who speaks, who lives, who is constantly surprising us with alternatives far beyond what our puny minds can grasp. That's the way it's always been. The writer to the Hebrews understood that. He simply said, remember this. Remember amidst all the changes of life, remember Jesus is the Christ yesterday, today, and forever. And it's that understanding, my friends, of the good news that shaped our understanding as to what it means to be church. Second Presbyterian Church has always been unabashedly Presbyterian. But never has it been clannishly Presbyterian. Gene Melder back in 1950 described it as a union church. Because he said so many of our members come from all kinds of different Protestant denominations as well as the Roman Catholic Church. And way, way back, 1902, that's before any of us here, Joseph Melbourne, who was the minister, said, there's something I want you to know. I want you to believe greatly in your church. I want you to believe in Second Presbyterian Church, but at the same time, I want you to learn to love all churches. I want you to love the Roman Catholic Church. I want you to love, he said, the Jewish synagogue. And I think were he standing here today, he would say, I want you to learn to love the Muslim mosque and the Hindu temple. Why? Because our mission is to reflect God's kindness by offering hospitality to everyone. Interesting word, that word, ecumenical. Its root is inhabited world. It's simply a way of saying the world belongs to God. Jesus Christ shares the addresses of the zip codes where we live. And so our mission is simply to mirror this hospitality, this good news. It was the year 1878. Immigration was a new issue for the city of Indianapolis because 15 to 20 Chinese families had located in the city of Indianapolis to serve as domestic workers. The question is, what are we going to do with these new immigrants? It was Second Presbyterian Church that led the way. It was Second Presbyterian Church that opened its arms to full participation to these people and later when they died provided them with burial plots in Crown Hill Cemetery. 
to be ecumenical is not to give up who we are, but it is to live out the love, the compassion, the grace of Jesus Christ. It is to build bridges of reconciliation across all the religious, racial, cultural, political, and identity ghettos that all too sadly divide us. The good news, a good news congregation, a congregation that extends its hospitality to all. And that becomes a congregation that engages the world culturally and socially. Back in the 1840s, it meant standing up against slavery, taking stands against racism. In fact, when you look at so many of the institutions in the city of Indianapolis, if you read their story, you will see the fingerprints of members of Second Presbyterian Church across so many of those organizations and institutions. And I could go on and list all that you do because you do so much. Let me simply say, From the beginning, you have put your arms around this city and around God's world. Every time I read the spire, when I open the bulletin to see what you all are about, I stand back in awe and gratitude to God for what you do. But it does raise one last question. Why do we do what we do? My wife Edie and I volunteer from time to time in our food pantry. If you have never visited our food pantry, I hope you will do so. It is a wondrous mini-mart. And so as I go through the door, I have the name of the party that I'm to host, and I say, welcome, I'm Bill. I'm so happy you're shopping with us today. We walk through the door, we grab grab a grocery cart, and we begin to walk the aisles as they do their shopping, and I begin to ask them questions to find out a little more about their life, about their family. And once we have finished our shopping, we go through another door, and we're standing in a hallway by ourselves, and that is when I say, thank you so much for shopping with us today. In my prayers this week, Is there anything in particular you would like for me to remember about you and your family? Only one person has ever said no. The stories are many, but one story deeply touched my heart. He was a young person, somewhere in his late 40s, early 50s. When you're an octogenarian as I am, that's young. He was a sometimes visitor to the food pantry. He spoke well. He was cordial. He had a first name that was like that of a former Olympic athlete. He was not that athlete, so that led to us talking about sports. I discovered he played a little football. He played a little baseball. And then he said, and you know, for a short time I was a diver at Indiana University when Doc Councilman was there. Well, soon we reached the door, we're standing in the hallway, and I turned to him and I said, called him by name, and I said, in my prayers this week, what might you like me to remember you in terms of prayer? Long pause. His eyes began to water. And then he whispered, yes. Will you pray that I'll learn how to forgive? I've never learned how to forgive. My friends, Second Presbyterian Church exists for one purpose. To share the good news of Jesus Christ by bringing the message of God's love and forgiveness to people where they live. Because when you've been kicked in the stomach and left lying wounded on the sidewalks of life, you need someone bigger than yourself to put their arms around you and to pick you up. Amen.